Hello. Looks like we got a couple people here already. Up to uh, where are we at? Eight viewers already. Not bad. So uh, we're going to start out by just introducing some of the different types of probe that are commonly used in embedded testing, and. Uh, to start, I'm going to be showing them off on this little uh, old Wi-Fi router. I'm not even sure what model it is. Uh, Linksys Wireless uh, WRT120N. And so this one has a pretty decent mix of fairly slow, like a spy bus, and I'm sure there's a UART console hiding on here somewhere. I've, I've never looked this far before, so uh, we'll see what we can come up with. But we've got some pretty slow stuff like a spy bus going to the boot flash. We've got some moderately fast stuff like the SRAM over here. And then we've got some RF coming off the antennas. And so there's a decent mix of stuff here. And obviously I've got more hardware we can go for and look at to see some additional stuff. Uh, Raspberry Pis, a full PC with PCIe and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Um, and then some fiber optic modules uh, that we can use to uh, uh, break out to uh, gigabit or 10 gig ethernet, some test fixtures for looking at base T ethernet, test fixtures for USB and so on. So uh, to start, I figure we'll jump right in and start using one of the common passive one mega ohm probes that everybody's familiar with. And then I'll show you some of the both problems with it as well as ways to get the most out of it. second here and okay so what we're looking at right now is uh, the scope view and let me just pull up the bench camera here I just reconfigured a few of the cameras here so bear with me for one second so I can get a long shot here actually uh, I'll just switch back to this view for a second and pop the microscope ID in there real quick. Okay, so let's begin by looking at this spy flash chip. So uh, we're looking at something nice and slow and it's a good start. Uh, one thing that's often overlooked in getting good probing results is making sure that you're making good contact with the signals on the board. And so the first thing you're gonna need to do is just clean things off. You can see this board's been, it's literally been sitting in a laundry basket in one of my storage rooms for probably five years. It's filthy, so I'm just going to get some alcohol and a swab and clean some of this dust off so we can make sure we get in good contact. This also helps get any flux residue and stuff like that out of the way. I also know from having very briefly poked at this board with a multimeter that uh, this pad right here that I'm hitting with the tweezers is ground. Um, okay. All right, All right, there we go. So this pad that I'm hitting with the tweezers right here is ground. And so uh, we can use that as our ground reference. We've also got back here, we've got this little switch that we can use for ground as well. Let me actually see if maybe the other camera will have a better view of this. Okay, this, this is probably a better view if I can just uh, maybe shift some of this around this way. So we can actually see what's going on with that. Okay, there we go. That looks like a better view. Alright, so we're going to be looking at this spy flash chip here. So, let me just pull up a data sheet so we know what we're looking at. <laughs> okay, I just saw a question from the peanut gallery. Um, yes, I have a literal laundry basket in my storage room upstairs of everything. It's uh, 
scrap boards from my own designs, random old routers. I think it's probably an old PC in there. There's some kind of a fiber channel switch I picked up at the Hardware Hacking Village at DEF CON. And just random interesting looking hardware. Some of it is operable, some of it's not. I use it whenever I'm like teaching somebody how to solder. It's nice to have a board that I don't care about them ruining, but it has a nice mix of modern and old technology on there. Uh, and so, yeah, this was this is pretty much the thing at the top of the pile. I figured half an hour before the stream started, I plugged it in. It looked like it was still booting, so I figured it would be a good test subject because, you know, we don't have to worry about ruining it. At the same time, it seems alive enough. We can get some interesting stuff off of it. Okay, so anyway, we're going to be looking at this spy flash. So let's just pull up a data sheet here so we know what we're looking at. So um, I'm not actually sure which flash this is. Let me see if I can get a vendor label. It, it's, it's some weird, probably cheap Chinese brand that I've never heard of before. But uh, that doesn't matter because spy flash is pretty much all uh, interchangeable. So let me pull up, um, we'll say, um, a wind bond that I use a lot. And they should be drop-in compatible pretty much as far as pinout and so on. It's all JX standard. So, so here's our pinout. So going back to the microscope view here. So we got our pin one marker down there. And so that's going to be chip select. We've got data out, write protect, ground, data in, clock, hold, or other I.O., and power. So we'll start by looking at the clock just because that's a nice repetitive signal to show off some of the differences between a couple different probe types. So the first one that we've got that we'll start with is probably the one everybody starts out with. So this is, uh, I mean, not this exact model, but this type of probe. So this particular one is a Teledyne the Cry PP022. It's a 500 megahertz capacitive divider probe, uh, 10 mega ohm input resistance, and 10 picofarad capacitance. And uh, right now I've got this one set up with the alligator clip ground blade. And the scope that we're using for the test right now is a 4 gigahertz Teledyne LaCroix Wave Runner 8404 M-MS. So let me get this. Uh, let's actually switch to the other camera for this view. So I'm going to get the ground just on the case of that switch over there. Maybe this will be a bit of a better angle for you to see what's going on. So we've got ground on the, I think it's the reset switch to wipe the config. And I'm just going to freehand hold this probe here on the clock line. Just bump this up so you can see the microscope view. So We've got, let's get the focus a bit better. Yeah. All right, that'll do. All right, so we've got our probe on the clock line. We've got our ground over here. And so let's see what the spy clock on this board looks like with this particular probing setup. And note, I'm not, I'm intentionally not saying, let's see what the waveform looks like because as you're about to see, how your probes are set up and how you ground them, how you connect them to the pin will make a big difference on what the signal looks like and how closely what you see on the scope approximates the actual voltages in the board. So I'm going to just drop to the scope view here. 
and hit the power. And let's actually let me just set up a trigger here for a second. Um, we're gonna trigger on channel two, and we're gonna set our level up about like that. So we should see anything that's toggling pretty easily. So now we're gonna turn on our 12 volt power. Let's go to normal trigger mode here for a second. All right, so it looks like we just have a burst of activity during boot or something and not too much after that. Oh, there's, there's occasional traffic, it looks. So we'll power it off, power it on again. So the first thing that jumps out is we've got this huge ringing on the rising edge here, a bunch of ripples here, huge dip down there. Now, this could be an indication of a poorly terminated line or general bad signal integrity, but it could also be from the probing setup. And so we're about to try a few different ways of measuring this same signal and uh, see how that changes things. So the very first thing that I'm going to do is just drop back to the long shot here for a second. So right now while I'm doing this, you'll note I'm still holding the probe by hand as we're working, and it's just annoying. It takes up a hand. I only have one hand to go hit buttons on the scope or configure the power supply or something. And that gets annoying pretty quickly, especially if we start looking at two or three signals at once. Now suddenly you're playing octopus. So there are a couple of different things that we can do in order to get better uh, results without having to hold each probe by hand. So let me just turn off power here for a second. Okay, so the first tool in my little bag of tricks here is this. This is a bipod probe positioner. This one happens to be Pico branded, but they're available from a lot of different manufacturers. I have actually basically this exact same probe holder with about three different brands on it. So they're all made by PMK. Everybody just rebrands them. Anyway, uh, this particular one I think is about 25 bucks or something. So they're, they're not at all expensive. Uh, if you Google around, there's also uh, even some STL files from people who have measured this same positioner and made a 3D printable version of it. Uh, that does not work as well as the real thing. The real version is actually injection molded plastic over a steel core. So if I pull off one of these rubber legs here for a second, you'll see that it's actually hollow and the plastic is metal filled to give it some more weight. And then it's got these rubber feet. So it does a pretty good job of staying put. If you can see, I'm, I'm jiggling it quite a bit with my finger and it, it's not really moving around too much. I mean, you know, it moves when I push it, but it's not super wobbly. And so it does a pretty good job of staying put on the bench and holding probes. There's a couple different ways you can do it. One of the ones that I usually do is if you can see the top is cut away here so that you can get the wire of the probe through and just kind of slide it on. Most of these probes have a kind of uh, tapered strain relief at the back. And so you can just slide the probe through until it won't go any further and you got a nice stable position. And then we can position this on our clock line. And look at that, hands free. Let's get the uh, solder smoke extractor out of the way so you can see better. So hands free probe holder, super simple, super cheap and uh, unbelievably useful. So if you don't have some of these, you should probably think about getting some. <laughs> Uh, so, again, this is not going to change our signal quality, but what it will mean is you can look at more signals at once, uh, and you have both hands free while you're doing it. Uh, again, if you have more than one or two probes, you really have to start using either things like this or soldering wires to the board. We'll, we'll get to some examples of how and why to solder either additional probes or just flying wires to the board, pros and cons of doing this, different ways of doing it to get better results, and so on. Anyway, so at this point, obviously nothing we've done is changing the signal that we're seeing. We're still looking at huge peaks and overshoots. And so the next option that we can use to try and get a slightly better result is to get rid of this long ground. So as I mentioned earlier, the input of this probe is about a 10 picofarad capacitance. And this long wire, I, don't, I haven't actually measured it, but it's fairly inductive. 
And so when you put however many nanohenries of inductance this is uh, across uh, this 10 picofarad capacitor, you get an LC resonance circuit, and that will tend to oscillate when stimulated. And so that's what we're seeing in the scope waveform is that LC resonance. So there's a couple different grounding options that can give you better results. One of the most common that is used all over the place, and I'm sure even on the really cheap scopes, this is available. Let's actually switch to the other camera. It'll probably be easier to see up close here. So this is a spring ground, and a lot of people don't even know what this is for because the manufacturers don't really do a great job of explaining what all these probe accessories are for. So the spring ground slides over the end. You can see the end of the probe is actually kind of coaxial in appearance. And so the spring ground just slides over that, making sure not to stab your finger in the process. And that gives you a relatively low inductance ground. So now you've got a much closer contact. You get right into the coaxial feed here and you can get a lot less inductance, which pushes that resonance higher out of band so that it'll have less detrimental effects on your signal. So we're gonna go back and put this same probe back on and now we're gonna go look at this exact same signal. Let's just get the spring positioned right. Uh, one downside to the spring grounds is it is a little bit more difficult to get them to work with any kind of probe position or something because you can see, uh, if I, maybe I'll switch to the microscope here, it'll be a little easier to see. So if I'm trying to get this probe needle here, if there is not a ground at exactly that distance, let's make this bigger so you can see. If there is not a ground at exactly this distance from my probe tap, I'm gonna have to make contact in the ground first and kind of bend the probe to do that. And Again, these, these probes are designed to do that, but it means you continually have to have force on the needle, or on the uh, spring. You have to be continuously applying force to the probe handpiece in order to maintain it in that sprung position. And so if I try to put a positioner on this probe, and then line it up and try and make contact there, if I let go, you can see it'll spring back. So it's a bit more difficult to try and get Try this again. Maybe if I put the needle on the other side there. Okay, yeah, so you can see this is becoming a bit of a pain to try and make contact on both sides. Uh, let's, let's actually see if maybe I can go to the other side here. Okay, that looks like it'll maybe work do that without shorting. All right, I'm just going to freehand this. So again, this is a pretty good example of uh, how these uh, um, how these uh, spring grounds do give better results, which you're about to see in a second as I go back to the scope view, but they are not good from an ergonomic perspective. They're, again, just a pain to use. So again, put the ground on there, put the probe tip on, and if we turn on power, scope trigger enabled. So we can see now that we've got a little bit of overshoot, but it's a lot less than we had before. And so this is probably a much closer, higher fidelity approximation of uh, what the actual voltage looks like. And again, this is the same probe on the same scope, all the same settings. I haven't changed anything except the ground. So if you're only using that long alligator clip ground, and you have a scope with more than about 10 or 20 megahertz of bandwidth, you are not getting the most out of it because your ground is limiting your performance. So 
let's take a look at a few other rounding accessories for this same probe just to compare. So in this bin here is all the various accessories that came with my passive probes, and I'm going to go through them a little bit. So we've got our color coding ring so we can tell probes apart, um, some spare probe tip needles, they do wear out over time, and I've never had to replace one, but I can tell, you know, some of them aren't quite as pointy as they used to be. Uh, and we got some more spare tips from a different brand of probe, we've got the little uh, screwdrivers, and actually I'll cover probe compensation a little bit, because that's another thing that a lot of people don't seem to be aware of. Then, this one is actually from a different type of probe, so this is uh, uh, what some other probe brands use instead of the... It's not focusing right, let me use switch to the other camera, you'll see better that way probably. So this is an alternative to the spring ground. It's, it basically does the same thing. It'll function the same way. You use it the same way. Um, the only difference is that the blade is flat. And so one of the advantages of this type of ground compared to the spring ground is you can get one of these little pieces of copper tape that a lot of higher end probes include, or you could just go buy copper tape. It's available all over the internet. And so you would stick a piece of this copper tape on top of, let's just pretend, this chip here, and then solder a few jumpers from it to ground. I've actually, let me, let me actually grab a, I've got a board that I did this to. So you can see on this board here, I've got a little bit of copper tape on top of uh, the Ethernet phi right here. And so if I were to put that blade ground on here, I don't have this board set up to actually demonstrate, but I'll just show you mechanically how the uh, ground attaches and so on. So if I pull up the eyepiece view here for a second. So just get this. Okay. There we go. Okay, so you can see in this particular case, I've got the uh, top grounded at only one point because I was only probing in that area. Um, you can and probably should ground at multiple points if you're going to be measuring all around the perimeter of the chip and so on. So the basic way that you use this is you stick the probe needle on whatever you're trying to measure and then the blade goes onto the ground copper on top of the chip. And so this gives you a nice easy way to hit any kind of QFP, QFN type device and uh, get a reasonable ground. Certainly it's way better than the alligator clip. It's again, it's not going to be as good as a spring ground right on a V or something like that. But there's, there's trade-offs with all these techniques. And I don't want to come across as saying one probing method or accessory or brand or model or whatever is superior to another in all cases because there's always trade-offs. Some of them cost more. Some of them are easier to hold. Some of them are just more convenient to use. Some of them have higher bandwidth. And so there are pros and cons to all of these. And what I'm really trying to show here is what various things are good for and what they're not. So again, we can just get up here. In this example, you'd want to flip it over to the other side. And so we could then hit one of these pins here with it. Um, with all of these uh, either spring or blade grounds, you do need to be careful with taller components in the board. So you can see right now, for example, if I'm trying to hit this pin, I am perilously close to the top of that decoupling capacitor. and 
I'm not sure off the top of my head which end of this is ground, but you could very easily short power to ground this way if you're not careful. So use of any of these bare ground accessories does require a little bit of extra caution. And one thing that I've actually been known to do at times is just get a little piece of capped on tape and stick it over parts of either circuitry or the ground lead in order to minimize the opportunities for things to short. Anyway, so let me go put this away and we'll continue down our tour of the accessories. Get this board out of the way and go back to the router. Okay, so the next is these. So this is another more unusual accessory that I've seen. Uh, LaCroix provides them with their probes. I believe these are also a PMK product, so other probe vendors probably uh, have them as well. And so what this is, on this end, it's a BNC connector. Wow, this is way overexposed. Okay, there we go. So on this end, it's a BNC connector. And so you can push this directly onto a BNC output on a device under test or a function generator or something like that. And on the other end, it has a custom made coaxial connection that is designed to accept a scope probe. And so you can push your probe into there and then connect your probe directly to a BNC signal output and get an extremely uh, high performance connection, again, within the limits of your probe and scope. But this allows you to go directly to a BNC output and get measurements off of it. I very rarely use these, but if you actually need to take measurements off of a device with BNC signal outputs, this is a super convenient thing to have. Then another one is this. So this is basically the same socket at this end. However, at the other end, it's got a center pin and uh, mounting calls for attaching to a PCB. And so if you are designing a probe that, sorry, if you're designing a board that has signals on it that you need to probe, you can potentially incorporate one of these uh, matching footprints into uh, the board design, solder one of these connectors on there and have a, again, fairly high performance test point. Now, again, there are going to be loading effects in the probe. There's going to be this stub coming off of the socket. And so we'll, we'll get to some of this a little bit later. But, uh, and then obviously the other trade-off with these is they take up space in the board. If you're not using them, they, they are pretty expensive. Um, I just have the ones that came free with the probe. I don't know off the top of my head what, say, LaCroix will charge you to get another of these sockets. But they're, they're probably going to be double-digit dollars, just as a guess by how much some of their other accessories cost. So they're not cheap, but they are a nice way to get a fairly high fidelity measurement. Just looking at the comments here for a second. Um, so yeah, the, the reason that the spring grounds are made of such stiff wires because if you use them in other applications, uh, they actually uh, it's actually beneficial if you're trying to wedge the probe between say, a signal and a larger grounded object at the side of the board or something, it's actually nice to be able to shove it in there and have it stay put. But yeah, for using with positioners, the spring grounds are very difficult to use. And I've had fairly limited luck trying to actually use them that way. Um, and so as far as uh, coax with jumpers off to the side, uh, the problem with doing that is your probe now has a 50 ohm input impedance and that leads to very high loading on the device under test. Now there are some applications where this is okay, but the majority of the time that is going to give you way too much loading on your signal. You're going to be significantly affecting the signal as you're probing and an ideal probe should be fairly non-intrusive. You don't want to modify the behavior of the device under test when you land a probe on it. So while that will work and it will have good grounding, uh, again, the loading is going to be pretty high. The typical trade-off for avoiding this uh, at the cost of attenuation and then higher noise in your front end is rather than having just coax with ground directly on either side and coax center contact on your test point, what you would do instead is you would put a resistor between the coax center conductor and uh, the probe tip 
And if you have, for example, a 450 ohm resistor, now you have a 500 ohm input impedance and a 10 to 1 division ratio. This is known as a transmission line probe. I have several of them. I've designed several of them. And they have, again, higher DC loading than something like a capacitive divider probe. But they actually will perform really well at higher frequencies into the gigahertz. And so it's a design that I feel hasn't got as much love as it deserves. I'm a big fan of them. But without the resistor, well, they will give good uh, S21 performance, so uh, conducted signal, the loading on the device under test is often unacceptably high. So if they do work for your application, good for you, but it is important to understand the trade-offs. Again, if there is not a resistor at the end of there, you will be putting a 50 ohm load across your device under test. You will be feeding your voltage directly into your scope, and so you're limited by the uh, amount of voltage that your scope inputs can handle. So in 50 ohm mode, that's going to be typically around 5 volts. Uh, you can use such a probe with a one mega ohm input, but only at really, really low frequencies because otherwise you get reflections off of that one mega ohm impedance at the scope input. Anyway, so continuing down the list of probe accessories, so again, we've got the um, compensation screws here, uh, or screwdrivers here, which I'll, I'll go over probe compensation momentarily. Uh, and then the last one is actually another of my favorites. I don't use it all that often, but when you do need it, it's super convenient. So this is a two-parter. You've got this longer wire, and you've got this collar that fits over the shaft of the probe. And if you look down the end, you can see, uh, it's a little hard to see in the, there we go, it's easier to see from this end. So you can see there's a metal collar in there that fits around the shaft of the probe. And so the way you use this is you unscrew this shielded piece here, you slide this on, screw that back over to hold it in place. And then this piece fits in over here. So now what you have is kind of a halfway between a spring ground and an alligator clip ground. It gives you a lot more range of motion than the alligator clip ground, but you do have more inductance than a spring ground. It is stiff rather than spring. I mean, there's a little bit of bendiness to this piece, but not much. And the cool part is that at this junction up here, you can rotate this wire in the socket. And since it's bent in this kind of Z shape, what you can do is vary the spacing between the signal on the ground in order to fit your test point, and it'll stay put. So let me go demonstrate this now on our spy flush. And this can work well with the probe positioners if you get things set up right. Again, it takes a little bit of time to get things aligned correctly. All right, so back to our spy flash. We've got, let's actually rotate this to there. So we've got our ground there and our signal there. That looks like about the right spacing. So let's see if we can make this a put. Okay, um, it may actually be easier to come in from the side, I think, like that. So if we just rotate this a little bit like that, now we've got what looks like pretty solid contact between the uh, signal and the ground and hands-free so if i go back to the scope view for a second we can see that again there is a little bit of overshoot uh, it's not nearly as bad as it was with the uh, long alligator clip wire it's definitely not as nice as it was with the spring ground so again it's a uh, midway point where you've got more inductance than the spring ground, less inductance than the alligator clip, and a lot more flexibility on positioning. So it's a good tool to have in the box. I don't see this on a lot of lower end probes. Uh, I've only seen this on LaCroix higher end passive probes, which actually uh, I believe the MSRP for this particular probe that I'm using is about as much as an entry level Rigel for the entire scope. So. Obviously, you're not going to see this on cheap probes. It, it may be possible to DIY something along these lines. I've, I've never tried because I've got 
better probes. But again, it's a, it's a good tool to have in the box and it's not appropriate for every situation, but if you understand what it's good for, it can be useful at times. So then before we jump into probe compensation, there is, um, I believe just one more, actually uh, two more accessories that uh, I wanted to cover. So one of them is, again, it doesn't really affect the signal much, but it can help as far as usability, is these little spring clips. So you basically just stick it under, around a pin, and actually I can't even get it onto the so it gets too small. Or, uh, so for uh, larger size devices though, it's nice to be able to just uh, pinch it on, hold things in place. So this is, I wouldn't say it has no place in modern board designs, but it's pretty rare I actually use one of these these days, just because they only really work on like dips and large through hole components and such, but they are hands-free, so if you don't have any of the bipods and your pin on your device under test is large enough to be able to access it, it, it can get the job done. Anyway, um, the last thing, which, again, a lot of people probably don't even know what they're for. They just see them in the bag of pro accessories and either throw it out or just leave it sitting around and don't use it for anything. I can count a few of these out here. Is the tip insulators. And so one common problem, if I just jump back to the microscope view for a second... So let's shift focus over to, say, uh, the RAM here. So we can see that we've got some fairly fine pitch stuff. And if you're trying to land a probe on one of these pins, you can see there's not a lot of space. And so if your probe slips a little bit, it's very easy to short from one pin to the adjacent pin. And this is obviously not good. And at best, you'll get garbage data. At worst, you may damage your device under test. And so these insulators are made to prevent this. So we've got a selection of them that, let me see if I can actually, it'll, it'll, probably, it'll probably be easier to just show them under the microscope. So we've got a range of them. So we've got this one here that just has a flat uh, opening on the tip. So to use this one, we would just slide this over our probe trying to do this, that blocking the camera is a little tricky. Slide this over the probe, grab it by the side so we don't stab ourselves with the needle coming out of the end. And so this gives you at least some insulation on the side of the probe shaft. You're less likely to go hit, for example, this capacitor here. Now you can hold the probe at any angle and be fairly safe as far as hitting that. But where it gets really cool is there are actually other of these insulators that are sized to fit different pin pitches. So let's see, the gray one, for example, looks like that might be a little bit too big. Maybe the blue one. Okay, the blue one looks like it might be good for this. Let's just check the others to see. They're all color-coded by size. So this is for like a psych or something. And that actually looks like the right size. So we'll do the green one for this. And, uh, yeah, 0.1-inch headers are about the smallest thing that those big clips are good for. So if we slide this insulator over, and did I get it on a one? Nope, not quite. There we go. Okay. So we can see now, if I just rotate this and look from the side, you can see the very tip of the probe needle is now between those two little insulators and everything else is insulated. So now we can hold this probe right on that pin and we've got these uh, little plastic fingers that number one prevent the needle from touching any of the adjacent pins and shorting it and also just kind of help to hold it in place. So for moderately small pitch QFPs and soics and things like that, these are really handy. Again, I don't use them all that often, but when you need them, you need them. Same thing here. You can actually use this one. Looks like yeah, you, you could you could make this work on a half and liter QFP. So, for really fine pitch stuff, when you're trying to get a probe in close quarters and not hit anything, these are super convenient. Um, I don't know what uh, 
if, for example, Rigo or any of the other cheaper uh, vendors have these. But the nice thing is uh, probes only come in a few sizes. And so if you have, I think this is a two and a half millimeter probe. So if you have a two and a half millimeter probe from any manufacturer, you can go buy just a bag of these grounding accessories and uh, uh, stick them on any other two and a half millimeter probe. And, I mean, again, a lot of these are made by PMK. They're going to fit pretty much all the probes because PMK OEMs uh, the probes for so many different vendors. And yeah, with the probe holders, those grounds are super nice. Are the insulators, sorry, are super nice. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to talk about before we get into other types of probe is compensation. So if I pull this probe off of the scope for a minute and go back to here. So the uh, typical passive divider probe, let me actually see if I can pull up the data sheet for this probe, see if that'll um, have a better schematic here. One second. I do not have the data sheet here. Let me just go download that real quick. And uh, yes, it, it may be possible to 3D print them or machine them. I've never attempted it. I don't actually have a 3D printer, so I have to go to Shapeways and pay real money to go get. Um, anything uh, 3D printed. Uh, I, I definitely would not recommend using FDM. Um, SLA, I think you've got a chance. If, if anybody does manage to pull it off, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, and you got a lot of these accessories, you know, they're, they are massively overpriced. They're basically just pieces of plastic made certain ways, and you know, they cost a few cents to produce. And uh, they're expensive just because there's a captive market, and you know, there's one or two companies that make them, and you have to either buy them or not have it. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up the manual for the PPO22 real quick here. So this is the LaCroix manual for this particular probe that I've been using. And so what I want to show is, okay, so this is another good uh, thing. I, I wasn't going to talk about probe loading till later, but we can see here that that 10 picofarad capacitance on the input, it... It says 10 megs. That's 10 meg ohms up to about a kilohertz. You start losing impedance. So at, what's this, about 20 kilohertz, your 10 meg ohm probe is 1 meg ohm. At 100 kilohertz, you're about 200K. By the time you get to a megahertz, or certainly 1.5 megahertz or so, your 1 meg ohm pro or 10 meg ohm probe is 10K ohms. So I'll, I'll put up a demonstration in a little bit showing just how bad the loading of some of these probes is. And while they say 500 megahertz, actually trying to use it on a 500 megahertz signal is unlikely to end well. You're either going to be measuring garbage or you're going to be degrading the signal so bad your device under test stops working and so on. Uh, anyway, so going back to the schematic, um, okay, they, I was hoping they'd have a nice schematic here showing um, what's actually going on inside. But essentially what they've got is either one um, variable capacitor, or in this case, they've got two, one for lower and one for higher frequencies uh, that's located inside the probe body. And by adjusting them, what you're doing is essentially matching the uh, probe to the oscilloscope input better so that you're not overshooting too much, you're not undershooting. And so we'll see a good example of this. I'm going to just pop up um, the, let's put the spring right back on. I'll just get the other probe. It's got the algorithm up on it. Just let me see if I can, let me see if I can compensate with the spring ground. That might be a better example. All right, so we're just going to go back to the normal trigger. I'm going to stick this on channel two. two. Yeah, I, I will use the algorithm for this just for demonstration purposes. jump back to the long shot here just so you can see a little bit better as I'm setting this up. So can I just go up there? Get that is better off. 
So off on the right side of the skull, if uh, I can get this camera, maybe if I just can't hold it or point it over that way. So off on the side of the skull, you'll see about here, this trigger cable out of you can see there. So you'll see there's a little pin sticking out here that'll say cow, and then one next to it that'll say ground. And again, the position of these is going to depend from scope to scope. But in order to compensate the probe, what you do is you connect the signal contact to there and the ground contact to the ground. So now you've got your, in our case, a uh, one kilohertz square wave. So let's just go get our positioning. Play with our offset a little bit to get it centered. Okay, so this is what the signal looks like coming off the probe as is. I haven't touched any of the compensation. So now I'm just going to take the. Actually, it's going to be easier if I take the probe off the scope for a second. So I'm just going to take these two little plastic caps off. So that's so there's two little plastic caps on here, which are sometimes a little bit tricky to get off. I might have to go tweezer this one. I just cut my fingernails and I'm regretting it. There we go. Okay, so if we look through here on the scope view, we can see that we've got these two tiny little trimmers inside the probe that we can stick one of these tiny screwdrivers down and uh, adjust. So I'm going to go put this back on the scope and we're going to see. So again, right now this is the waveform without any changes to the uh, compensation. So it looks like, is there actually a third? Okay, so there's actually, I didn't notice that. Okay, so there's actually a third um, compensation capacitor on here on the back side that doesn't have a cover. We can see on that side. So I'm actually gonna put the probe on the other way around so we can see that box a little bit better. I'm just going to go slide the compensation screwdriver in there a little bit and see. Okay, there we go. So we can see if the, this is the low frequency compensation. So we can see if the low frequency screw, this is the one, the single one, not the double one, on the back side is misaligned. We've got the edge is going to rise, then uh, it'll hit a peak, and then just kind of slowly rise the rest of the way. And if we go the other way, you can see the opposite happens. It overshoots and then starts uh, dipping before it levels off. So I'm just going to turn this screw just a little bit so it's as flat as we can get it. That looks pretty good. And then I'm just going to flip the probe around so I have easy access to the other side. And then we're going to do the high frequency compensation. So we do the one closer to the scalp first. probe is fairly well compensated as is. I'm just making small adjustments to show the effect. I'm fairly 
seen any change here. Yeah, I think this is about as good as it's going to get. So we can see there's just a little bit of peaking there. And some, some of that is just inherent in the probe design. It, it is difficult to get a completely flat response out of these. Anyway, so I think that's about it for the capacitive divider probe. Let me just put the compensation screws back on there. And actually, let me see if I can get this to compensate just a little bit better with the spring ground, just to show how much of a difference the inductance there will make. All right, so I just put the spring ground on. I'm putting the probe back, and I'm going to see if I can get this. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to get the spring ground on there. And uh, yes, non-inductive screwdrivers are good. Um, as far as uh, one megahertz signal, um, so actually what you can do is, okay, yes, yeah, so for operators, they do actually suggest a higher frequency. Um, so what I can use is the auxiliary output on the scope for the higher frequency compensation. That, that might have been my problem. Sorry, I, I don't actually use these low speed probes that much. Um, so we can go to output and we can get a fast edge. All right, actually we can use the one meg output on there. So that'll work. Um, okay. So I go back to the cal output here and see if we can see anything better for one meg output on the signal. Okay, there we go. All right, yeah, that, that'll show a little bit better. So if we go back to the 1K and tune the first again. flatten that as much as we're going to on the 1K, then switch to the 1 meg. And then we're going to twiddle the first not really too many good ways to work around. I wonder if I use the auxiliary output for the calibration if I can get a slightly better detail. So yeah, I did switch to the spring round to go get this result. Alright, that looks that looks not bad enough. Alright, I'm just gonna put this probe away.
And yeah, uh, Andrew, good catch on the one megahertz signal. I, for some reason, I had forgotten to switch. <laughs> All right, so I hinted about transmission line probes before, and now is actually probably a good time to introduce them, as long as we're talking about relatively low-cost passive probing options here. So, this is this looks just like a standard passive probe. Uh, this is a Pico TA061. This is a 1.5 gigahertz passive probe, which uh, has an MSRP around, I think, $330 last time I checked. And so this is a 500 ohm impedance at DC, but it also stays flat-ish. This, this is one of the lower end transmission line probes. It's, it's not all that great, but you'll still, you're going to see a big difference in this compared to the capacitive divider probe. And so uh, this one does require the scope have 50 ohm inputs. If you don't have a 50 ohm input in the scope, you'll have to add an external 50 ohm terminator, and this can degrade performance. Anyway, so we've got our alligator clip ground and our uh, probe tip set up just like we did with the 10 meg probe. And what I want you to pay attention to here, if I just pull back a little bit on here. I have no idea what the trigger settings are compared to what we were using before, so I'm just gonna jump back to that. So we get our I'll get a clip ground on there, stick our positioner on, and we're gonna land our probe on the clock just like we had before. Um, also, one other thing that I'm just gonna point out here is this particular probe actually has a pogo pin as the tip, so it's a little bit springy, which definitely helps when you're using the positioners as far as it staying put a little bit better. Anyway, let me turn power on here. And okay, so we're getting garbage because I didn't change it to 50 ohm input. So we're gonna tell it this is a 50 ohm input with a divide by 10. And jump down to about there. trigger set up. Alright, so the first thing that you'll notice using the transmission line probe, we're still using the long alligator clip ground. So this is a very inductive ground, and we can see there is some ringing on the signal. It's not at all perfect, but it's so much better than it was with the 10 meg probe. And this is because this probe has a 2 picofarad input capacitance instead of 10. And so you get a lot less of that ringing, and the uh, resonant frequency of the probe is shifted a lot higher. Now, 2 picofarads are still pretty high as the transmission line probe goes. Uh, I have another one that I believe is 0.3 picofarads, so 300 femtofarads capacitance. But even so, you can see we're getting a fairly high fidelity representation of this signal despite using the long ground lead. So now let's see how much better it gets with the spring ground.
All right, so we got our spring ground here. All right, I'm just gonna share the link to see if anybody else is interested in joining here. Ready. <coughs> All right, so now we're using the same transmission line probe, but using the spring ground, and I'm going to see if I can get the spring ground to make good contact on it here, and jump back to the scope view. And trigger armed, and ground slipped off again. Come on, stay put. There we go. All right, so at this frequency, this probe is working really well with the spring ground. So we can see it's there's even less overshoot than there was with the um, with the capacitive divider probe, and the um, even with the spring ground, this probe is still giving you sharp rise time. So and again, there is a little bit of overshoot, especially on the falling edges. There's a bit of ringing. I'm not sure how much that is present in the actual circuit. So. We'll take a look at some additional probes and see if we can get some better results. Again, we're still looking at the same spy signal. There's there's more fun stuff coming. Uh, these probes are good out to, again, officially it's 1.5 gigahertz. In my experience, it's more like 1.2 that you start to see issues. Um, however, they are not at all flat on the frequency response. These probes do have pretty bad peaking on faster edges. So at about 700 megahertz, so they're something like two dB higher than they should be. And so that leads to a lot more. It actually will magnify existing overshoot of the signals and it'll make edges look faster than they really are. All right, so the next probe that we're going to look at is the first of the active probes. Uh, so this particular one is a LaCroix ZS1500. It's a 1.5 gigahertz active probe with uh, 1 mega impedance and 0.9 picofarad input capacitance compared to the 10 meg and 10 picofarad that we had on the capacitive divider probe. And so this directly translates to the probe having significantly lower loading. Um, and uh, generally better performance, again, much higher bandwidth. This is three times the bandwidth of the 500 meg passive probe. Uh, however, there are a few downsides. The first one is that active probes in general are going to have a limited operating range. So this one is 20 volts peak to peak maximum before you risk damaging it because the head of the probe inside this injection molded plastic body there's actually some sort of uh, probably a jfet based amplifier and if you exceed the maximum voltage it'll handle then you fry the amplifier and uh, your probe is garbage 
and they're not really repairable. You know, everything is sealed in, and it's all ASICs anyway, so you basically just have to buy another probe, and considering that MSRP on these is about, I want to say $2,200 for this 1.5 gigahertz probe, you do want to use some caution in working with them so that you don't destroy them. Um, and also, this 20 volt range, this is a fairly wide range active probe. This is kind of a fairly general purpose active probe. A lot of the higher speed differential probes have much lower maximum voltages. Uh, so, the other downside to most active probes, again, there are some exceptions, but most active probes is that they are vendor proprietary. So, this one is a LaCroix design. It will not work with any other scope other than LaCroix. And you can see, if I take a look at this interface, we've got the. Uh, So you can see we've got the, this is uh, LaCroix ProBus interface, we've got the BNC here, and then on uh, this side we've got six pogo pins uh, that, uh, I, I don't remember what the pin out is, somebody's reverse engineered it. It's I squared C, ground, plus or minus 12 volts, and a presence attack signal, basically. And so this is a LaCroix proprietary standard, you know, all the I squared C is basically just an EEPROM, and in some cases there's some DAX or something for trimming and calibration. But all of that info is the for proprietary, and again, it won't work with any other scope. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Um, PMK does make a small number of active probes. This is actually based on a PMK design. So if you go to PMK, or I believe Pico rebrands them as well, you can get this same probe head with a generic BNC body that has a barrel jack on the side to take, I think it's like 12 volts or something DC power input. And that is a generic active probe that will work with any scope. Um, the only real difference is the ZS1500 has all of the, again, discovery EEPROMs and everything, so the scope will auto-detect it and set the gain correctly and everything. Um, also, the ZS1500 does have the ability to do hardware offset for looking at signals with a strong DC bias up to, again, no more than 20 volts. Uh, whereas the uh, Tetris 1500, which is the PMK design this is based on, does not have that capability, and so it's limited to, I think, plus or minus 8 volts. Anyway, so I'm going to connect this to the scope, and we can see right off the bat the scope detects it. And uh, let's go back to the scope view. All right, so you can see right now it's showing DC 50 ohms. So if we plug in the probe, it'll change just saying DC coupling, so it knows that we're using an active probe. And if I click on this, it'll actually show we've got DS 100 serial number, bandwidth gain and so on. Uh, some probes do have settings in this page you can tweak, this one doesn't. So going back to the scope view for a minute. Uh, this probe, actually uh, the other camera is probably going to go into this. So this probe has a couple of different grounding options. The one that I use the most is, they call it the Z-ground. It's basically the same thing as that one that I showed for the uh, one meg or the 10 meg probe so it's got a little z-shaped flexible wire it's a lot shorter obviously because they're targeting higher bandwidth and they want lower inductance and so you can adjust the spacing of that compared to the tip to get different signal and ground spacing uh, these are difficult to use in positioners because of the way that they're shaped uh, there is a positioner available for this that it came with i've had trouble getting any kind of good performance with it as far as actually being able to keep it in a place that i can reach So again, get our signal and our ground in place. Go back to the scope view. All right, so it looks like we're seeing a little bit of some different ripples and so on on there. But at this point, you know, this is a nice enough looking signal. I'm, I'm reasonably sure some of that overshoot is actually present in the real signal. And note again, we don't have some of that ringing that we had with the transmission line probe. That ringing on the falling edge on some of them, but not others, is that, that's quite interesting. I don't know what's causing that. Um, it, it would not surprise me if that's present on the actual board. I wonder if that's... I wonder if that's crosstalk or something from another line, perhaps. Because the, the way that it's the way that it's shaped and the fact that it only occurs on literally every other bit, that that's making me think it's actually there. 
Anyway, so here's the active probe. Let me go put this away, and we'll jump to some other types of probes. So there's a few. There's actually one other kind of passive probe that I haven't covered yet that is quite interesting, and that again, it, it doesn't get as much attention as a lot of people uh, think it deserves. And so what we have here is uh, a near-field electromagnetic field probe. So it's basically an antenna that is designed to pick up signals in the near field rather than the far field. So it's deliberately got a short range that it's meant to couple capacitively or inductively to uh, your device center test. So I'm going to go and just take the dust caps off of these cables here. They come in a couple different sizes. I've got a set of four that you can buy on Amazon. I think it's like 200 bucks for the set. Um, it's made by, I think, TechBox is the company name. And so uh, they've got, I believe it's uh, one magnetic field probe and three electric field probes with different sized loops that they essentially, they trade uh, sensitivity for spatial locality. So some of the probes are designed to pick up signals from further away and others are designed to have shorter range on purpose so that you can narrow down exactly where a signal is coming from. And so um, these are typically used for EMC compliance testing and so on. So if you have a board that is radiating too much at some frequency and you don't know where you're radiating from, it's nice to be able to just go drag one of these probes over the board and figure out exactly what your unintended or intended antenna is. Alright, so I'm going to power this up. <clears throat> I'm going to jump into the auto trigger mode. Go to 50 ohm, which we're on, 1x, and I'm just going to start holding this probe over the board and wave it around a little bit and see if we can see anything. There we are, starting to get some traffic. So what I'm doing is holding this probe over this metal structure that I'm pretty sure is the Wi-Fi antenna for the bar. And so you can see if I move the antenna, if I move the uh, antenna away just a little bit, like to say here or something, the scope will stop triggering. And so these are, again, deliberately short range antennas that are designed for picking up signals at contact to near contact ranges and allows you to localize the origin of the signal rather than just decoding it. Now, of course, you can actually just look at the signal. So if I go to turn our scale up a little bit, um, let me actually see if I can get this in a positioner just so I don't have to hold it quite so much. All right, so it looks like now we're getting some decent Wi-Fi data. So if I jump to the spectrum analyzer view here for a second, so we're going to be looking at channel 2, and we know we should be seeing around 2.4 gig. Alright, that looks pretty good.
the three is probably this. I have no idea what frequency, what channel this thing was configured to be on. Again, I just pulled it out of a dumpster. This, this was probably uh, out of a laundry basket. This was my old Wi-Fi access point back when I was in grad school that I got rid of ages ago. And so, you know, who knows what it was configured for at this point. But we can see we've got a nice, uh, looks like about a 20 megahertz wide channel right there and then a bunch of sidebands and stuff, which again, is to be expected. Um, where it starts to get interesting though is we can also use this to pick up other signals. So if we jump out of spectrum view mode again, go back to there. So it, it may be hard to pick up on this board just because again, there is so much deliberate radiation from the antennas. Um, but let's see if I can pick up anything off of the RAM. So yeah, we are seeing some things that look like they're probably not from there. Um, maybe on the CPU, we'll see some of that. All right, so there's, there's Wi-Fi. There's the main sock. I'm actually going to switch to one of the other antennas, see if we can get a slightly shorter range signal, and we can see if we can pick up leakage from the RAM rather than... So what I'm doing now is I'm swapping out this probe with the big loop for this probe with the smaller loop. And so that should let us localize to see a little bit closer on, again, the RAM or something like that. Alright, that looks like it's probably... Alright, yeah, we are still picking up Wi-Fi, but... This, this is a little bit of a pathological case as far as actually having... Um, as far as having a strong transmitter in very close proximity to the other things that we're looking at. If, if we were actually trying to do EMC debug or something, I'd probably con configure it to actually stop broadcasting or something like that. But anyway, so we are starting to see some bursts of activity on here. So let's zoom out a little bit and see if we can get... Yeah, that looks like it's probably RAM activity. So I'm going to jump to the spectrum analyzer here and see if we can find something that's not in 2.4 gig. So if we go to 1 gig... Ooh, is that what I think it is? Okay, yeah, so we're seeing at 700 megahertz looks like it's a peak. Um, okay, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're looking at the RAM here. So, just to check, um, turn our resolution down a bit. Let's see if we can see something a little bit more around there. So, yeah, I got to like 700 megahertz, so. Yeah, it, it, is, it is hard to see, but. We got a max hold mode. There, okay, there we go. We can see better in max hold. So yeah, right around 700 megahertz, we're seeing a pretty strong peak in the spectrum coming off the RAM. And so that's telling me that we're probably looking at either the data rate of the um, RAM clock or maybe some harmonic thereof. So again, it's, it's, it's a useful tool to have for EMC problems and so on. Uh, it's not something I would use the general receive antenna. You know, these are not meant to be used uh, for demodulating signals over the air, but specifically for a short range use, picking up signals that you didn't intend to radiate. But if, if you've got leakage somewhere on your board and you don't know where it's coming from, they're great.
all right, let's let's actually shift focus to the uh, back to the spy flash, I guess, um, and see if we can do some comparisons of loading of different probes on there. See if we can see the shape of the waveform changing when I connect different probes to it. Um, as far as frequency domain filtering on the time domain signal, um, yes, uh, not with the setup that I'm demonstrating right now. So, um, LaCroix does have a DSP filter package available for their scopes. I don't have it installed. Um, it is possible to do in post-processing with GLSCOP client, which I'm going to be doing some GLSCOP client stuff a little bit later in the day. Um, however, with the LaCroix software and not having the, I think it's the DFP2 option, then, uh, uh, okay, so I know we're going to be doing more um, spy flash analysis, or actually maybe we can shift focus to the RAM, look at some of the higher speed stuff on the RAM. Let me pull up a data sheet for this RAM and see what it is. W9425, 9425, G6, EH, Dash three H. That looks nine four two five G six. Okay. All right. So yeah. So it's a. This is a DDR one RAM. It looks. So we got DDR RAM. Uh, let's get a pinout here and see what we want to look at on here. Okay, there we go. There's our pinout. So it looks like we got a bunch. Uh, it looks like it's a 16-bit data bus. We've got our main clock there. We've got um, let's see, uh, grass and caster over there. Upper DQS is there. There's our lower DQS, like a lower DQS there. Okay, so this is DDR1, so we've got single-ended DQS lines, and then the DQ lines are also single-ended. Uh, clock is differential. Okay, so let's see if we can see anything on this RAM. Let me actually, I'm going to switch to the, uh, actually, we, sh we should be okay still with the 4 gigahertz scope for this um, measurement, I think. Right, so we got DDQ, okay, so all the DQ pins are connected to, they're next to power, and then the address pins are probably, okay. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking about how we're going to set up probes on this. Um, so let me actually start with the ZS1500 and see what we can see just using the single-ended 1.5 gig probe, figure out how fast the RAM clock is running and so on. This is actually going to be a good uh, demonstration of some of the different trade-offs of these probes as you get to higher bandwidth. So, let's see what we got. We see our clock pin. That's pin 45. 
right, let's let's figure out where that is. So that's our ground at 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. That's interesting. Okay, uh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong side of the chat. All right, let's, let's try that again. Uh, so that's one. So our chip is actually rotated 180 from how the uh, pin diagram is shown. Okay, so that's pin one. That's VDDQ. Okay, that makes more sense. So diagonally opposite then, um, that'll make this 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. 41, 42, 43 is the no connect. 44 is... 44, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43 is no connect. 44 is clock enable. 45 is clock positive. 46 is clock negative. So it looks like this is our RAM clock, that differential pair coming off there. And so we actually could do a differential measurement on this clock if we wanted to. I'm going to try to do single ended first. Okay, so that's our clock. Now, when you're looking at a uh, higher density board like, you're looking at a higher density board like this, one of the challenges is going to be finding a ground to use for your signal. So in this case, um, that pin all the way at the end is the closest ground, and there may be some of these other things may be ground. So I'm actually gonna grab a multimeter and find what's grounded around here. So we know that in 34 is ground. Okay, so that top one there is ground. That's ground. Okay, so we got some convenient grounds right near our signals. All right, that should be good. So both of those two, all the all those videos are ground. That's not ground. That's not ground. That is ground. Okay, so that big V is ground. All right, so yeah, we've got those two. So from here to here is our clock. So there's our um, clock plus is here, clock minus is here, and then we got ground meter. So that's actually a fairly nice layout for probing. So we got lucky. I'm curious if they were supposed to do some kind of like pull downs or terminating resistors, something at that spot. That, that looks like it's probably meant for some kind of termination. Um, what I'm actually what I'm actually thinking, looking at that layout, is that is probably. 30402 resistor footprint. So you could put either a um, resistor here and a resistor here to terminate to ground or a resistor here to terminate differentially. It's kind of, I'm, I'm guessing that's probably how this was meant to be used. Anyway, so we know that's ground. We've got our signal right there. Let's see what we can see on the scope. Let's see what our frequency is. That'll inform the rest of our measurements here. All right, so we're looking at 175 megahertz-ish, um, which is lower than I expected. So this is DDR333 that we're looking at here. So not all that fast. I may actually want to switch to something else to see a faster signal, but it'll be a good start. So 
first thing of note to me is that the signal looks pretty sinusoidal. I'm curious if it actually is shaped like that or if that's just an artifact of our measuring because this, this probe should have the bandwidth to see higher uh, speed stuff on there. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if they've got slew rate limited drivers or something like that on here. Um, so let's, let's take a look at some of the DQ lines. So um, the very bottom we've got BSS and DQ15. So this is some of the actual RAM data pins. So what we're looking at is, we go, this is the 15th data bit. So we got here, we're looking at the bottom two pins on there. And so we can see that with the, there we go. So we can see that um, the, we've got fairly good rising and falling edges on here. It looks fairly smooth. There, there looks like there's maybe some overshoot on some of them but it's not too bad. And so this probe is probably adequate for this kind of measurement. Um, just for comparison's sake though, I'm gonna jump back to the capacitive divider probe and we'll see what that 500 megahertz probe sees instead. So I'm going to use the spring ground and get on there. Right, so it looks like I'm probably not going to be able to fit the insulator on there for this. It's a little annoying. All right. So again, note that right now we've got fairly clean edges that don't have a ton of overshoot or ringing or anything like that and they look to be hitting about it's probably about two and a half volts at the high so now i'm gonna see actually that that the uh looks like it should be ground oh, let's make sure six down from the end Yeah, that's speedy. No, wait. That's speedy DQ. Okay, so that is not a ground. Um, but that one at the end is ground. Okay, so we're going to use that as our ground. I'm actually going to switch to one of the other uh, DQ pins just to be able to get uh, easier. Okay, so yes, all right. So those are all data pins. So what we're seeing now is with the spring ground and uh, the uh, capacitive divider probe, we can see there's a fair bit of overshoot on the signal, and especially some of them are not looking all that pretty. In particular, we've got this big dip in the middle of all of the edges. We've got an overshoot and ring on there. So even with the spring ground, the capacitive divider probe is not really doing uh, wonders for our signal quality. Again, this, this DDR1 is kind of at the lower speed of where um, these passive probes stop being that useful. So we may want to switch to something a little bit faster. So um, I guess at this point, <coughs> uh, question for the audience. So right now we are looking at uh, this same little Wi-Fi router, which again, is uh, nothing super fast on it. Uh, do you want to keep working on this? I can go maybe do some uh, 
Logic Analyzer probing, talk about securing Logic Analyzer probes and uh, different grounding techniques for those on the spy flash, things like that. Um, or we can shift focus something a bit faster, uh, switch to say a Raspberry Pi and look at some of the uh, MIPI and PCIe and so on. So uh, what do you folks want to say? Just uh, leave suggestions in the chat. I'm just going to go and put away these probes I was just working on and then we'll decide what to do next. All right, so we got a vote for the Raspberry Pi and uh, no suggestions for anything else, so that's what we're going to do. So what I've got here, I believe this is a Pi 3 uh, B+. Plus. So there's no PCIe on here, but we got uh, MIPI. <coughs> We've got uh, maybe you can do some HDMI. We've got uh, USB and a couple of other things on here that should still be fun to play with. Um, let's see what else do we have in there? Yes, we got the USB 3, we've got the Ethernet, um, so lots of things to do. We can, I've also got an Ethernet test fixture that we can use for some testing as well. Uh, so before we do any of that, I'm just going to need to go set up power on this because I don't have a Walmart to power it hooked up, so I'm just going to go grab one. Uh, I'm also going to uh, step away for a minute and uh, get a sip of water because I've been talking for an hour and a half and uh, I'm getting a little thirsty, so I'll be back in two minutes.
Okay, so I'm back. I've uh, got the wallwort for the Pi. I am just going to have to crawl behind the bench because that's the closest outlet to go plug it in. No matter how many power outlets you put in the lab, there's never enough. Okay, so we've got the Pi booting up. It's got the LCD attached. Again, this is a Pi 3B Plus with the MIPI, uh, I think it's like 724A or something display. And so we should be able to have some fun taking a look at the signals on the display connector. So our pinout here is essentially um, at either end, there's some power I squared C and so on. Then we've got our three differential pairs here, which I believe is uh, MIPI clock, one lane of data, other lane of data and then there's grounds in between them. So we can do single-ended or differential probing as we see fit on all these signals. So just to start, I'm gonna jump back to the 1.5 gig active probe here. And we're just gonna take a quick look at these lines and figure out which one's which. It's been a little while since I've poked at any of them. So I just gotta make sure I remember which one's clock and which is data and so on. This ground also does not want to stay put for me right now. Let me try the other side. So this is a little bit of a confined space, which makes it difficult. You can see, uh, well, if I shift the part a little bit, there's the heat sink of the CPU is right there. So I'm kind of coming at a weird angle here. And this will be a nice chance to talk about some of the different ways of securing probes for different speeds and so on. All right. Are we getting something now? Okay, so that is our MIPI data line, it looks. And I believe that makes... Is this the clock then? Okay, this is our clock. So let's confirm that. So the second pin is our clock. Yep, that's our clock. All right, so there's a couple of different things that we can do as far as getting signals off of this board. Uh, let's see. So the handheld different the handheld single-ended probe that we've been using, the ZS1500, is not great for this kind of work because the MIPI is all differential. So both the clock and the data are differential. Um, we can do single-ended measurements of a differential pair. This this will work fine um, as you you lose some dynamic range and you get a little bit more noise, but you can do it. Um, However, this handheld probe, it's, it, you can see it's just, it's ergonomically awkward to try and get in there. So I don't think it's gonna be the best choice for this. Uh, what's good for if you try to do longer term measurements of a signal, again, especially if it's in an awkward spot and confined and hard to work with, is uh, a differential probe, either a soldering one or one that's more compatible with positioners. So the first one that I'm gonna pull out here for demonstration, I don't think it's gonna be the best one to keep on here. Um, is uh, this one. So this is one of uh, LaCroix's Wavelink active probes, uh, in particular the D400A AT. So the way that the Wavelink system works is they've got two modules. There's the probe amplifier and what they call the platform. So this is the platform cable, a WLP bus 2 in this case. This is a Pro bus 2 interface. Uh, it connects to the scope of the same active probe connector that the CS1500 had. It's got a little latch to hold it in place so that it won't 
to come loose and mess up your signal. And then here is the actual differential amplifier module. Uh, this particular one is a handheld browser probe, so you can see it's got um, positive and negative contacts there. It's got a uh, little spot on the side to go connect the ground just to make sure that you don't have common mode offsets between your probe and the rest of the circuit. And so I'm just going to screw this together. That the scope. And so there actually are positioners specifically for holding these, so I'm going to go grab one. Okay, so the way that this probe works, if I grab the here, okay, so I gotta I gotta remember which of these pins is ground before I do anything else. Uh, so if this is a differential probe, um, however, you still need to make sure that the common mode is not too far out of range. If the uh, I believe there's like a five volt or something common mode uh, range on this probe, and so if the DC offset gets too far, then it will damage the amplifier. And so if you have a pro, if you have a device that's powered by, in this case, like an isolated two-prong power supply that's not Earth, uh, then there is potential for just static charges and random other currents coupling into the board to mean it's biased. Again, that very low current, but it may have a bit of a DC bias on it. And so you always want to make sure that you do ground at least one of your differential probes, unless you are probing something like a PC or something with a three-prong plug that the body is actually definitely grounded. So, I'm just going to look up the Pi GPIO pinout here for a minute because I don't have that handy for some reason. Okay, so uh, pin 9, so that's Skip four, it's the fifth one from the top on the inboard side. So you got one, two, three, four, five. So that should be ground. Okay, so we're gonna take the cap off of the probe so we can actually get the contacts on. Stick it in the positioner. You'll notice that the probe body actually, uh, I don't know how well you can see the color in the webcam view, but you can see that the probe body is lit up in pink, so that means that it's on channel two. The LED will actually change color depending on what channel you're on. So just for demonstration purposes, if I take it off channel two, you can see it'll turn off. I plug it to channel three, it should light up blue. Yeah, it flashes green for a second just to indicate that the scope detected it, and then it turns blue to say that it's on channel three. All right, so we're gonna go back to channel two just because that's where we had the other stuff on. So it should turn pink. All right, so now I can go and connect our ground to the probe. And now we have the fun of trying to actually get this probe on the board, which if I freehand it, it should be okay. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to pull it off with the positioner. Uh, because it has to come in at a pretty steep angle in order to hit the signals. Yeah, even that's going to be tricky. So what I think I'm actually going to do is I think I'm actually going to hit the pins on the... Um, let me just play with the brightness here for a second. Um, there we go. So what I think I'm actually going to try to do is I think I'm going to hit the pins on the ribbon cable itself rather than down there just because, again, trying to get in around the heat sink is going to be tricky. So uh, with this particular probe, there's a little slider here that I can adjust in order to change the space in between the needles. So I'm going to just adjust that until it looks like we're about where we need to be. 
I'm going to try looking at the clock. This is good. That, that's probably going to be okay. Let's find out. That looks like it should be good. Let's power on and see what we see on the scope. Um, okay, oh, I almost forgot. Um, before I actually connect it to the circuit, we want to take it off. And uh, so differential probes are measuring the voltage at input positive minus negative. And so they will occasionally drift due to the amplifier having natural losses and so on. They do calibrate it, but it's always a good idea whenever you're setting up a new differential probe setup, just hit the zero button on you. It's either going to be on the probe or the scope. And so it'll take a few seconds and you'll hear some relays clicking and so on. And then it'll just adjust the DC bias somewhere in order to remove the offset. Alright, so now I'm going to land this on the differential clock. So there is our MIPI clock. It actually is pretty sinusoidal, that's just the way that the driver works on the board, so this is not a limitation of the Pro. Uh, and then if we go to the next pair over, we can see the data. So this is uh, MIPI DeFi. So the way that DeFi works, if we zoom out a bit, okay, so it looks like uh, this is actually a good example to talk about uh, differential pair polarity. So this is a differential measurement, but I'm constrained by the geometry of the probe to have the um, probe on either the positive or the negative half of the signal, and I can't see both. Or sorry, um, I can't choose the ordering because if I were to try to come from the other direction, the geometry of the probe would just not work. There wouldn't be any way to get the needles on there. And so typically there's going to be a invert button on the probe. So you can see here that will correctly adjust the, uh, it'll flip the voltage. So basically just flip the sign so that a minus becomes a plus and plus becomes a minus. And so now we're seeing the correct polarity. And so what this means is that this differential probe is, um, has the right side positive, and so this means on the actual board, the left side is positive. And the way you can tell is because if I adjust the... Uh, did our probe just slip or something? Oh, I'm gonna, where my, I gotta figure out where our signal just went. Yeah, we still have video on the screen. All right, what just happened here? Okay, we're, we're good now. I'm not sure what happened there. Something something got jiggled. Okay, there we go. So again, if we adjust our trigger level to be here, we can see that we've got bursts of activity. And so the way that DeFi works is it's actually got... Um, there's a uh, high speed and a low speed state and uh, the low speed signaling mode um, uses fairly high voltages uh, i think it's like 1.5 1.8 volts something like that um so what just happened again it looks like something like the sleep or something i don't know if it's display power management on the pi or something is maybe putting it to sleep, that might be what's going on. Um, that, yeah, that, that probably is what's going on. So I'll just have to jiggle it every once in a while to wake it up. 
But um, anyway, so it's got a low power and a high power state, and or a low speed and a high speed state. So the low speed state has a fairly large swing. The high speed state is much smaller swing, and uh, it will use uh, the low speed state as kind of a alert to indicate that a packet's about to start, and then it'll switch to the high speed state for the actual packet data. And so this means that, for example, trying to do an iPad or something else off of a MIPI D5 signal is a bit of a pain because you can't just do a normal PLL clock recovery to it. You have to resync at the start of each packet. Anyway, so right now, again, this is with a uh, handheld, in this case not a positioner, but it's a different, an active differential probe looking at the positive and the negative legs and subtracting them, looking at one scope channel. So there are other options that we can use for this. So we're going to just close that for a minute and go back to the scope view. So I'll leave that there. Just disconnect our power for a second. So there are some higher performance passive probes that can be used for this application. So let's let's actually switch to uh, one of those Pico passive probes that I was talking about before, the 1.5 gigahertz ones. See how they perform for this application. I, I think they're going to start having issues with loading and, um, well, both loading and peaking at these frequencies, but let's have a look and see. So we're going to use, this is DC 50 ohm, and it's a times 10 probe. And we're going to turn power on, and see if in any way, shape, or form I can get this to stay put. Oh, that's actually not bad. Um, We set our trigger level up here. We got a normal trigger. So what we can see is the DeFi data with Again, this is a 1.5 gigahertz passive probe. So you're looking at one leg of the signal only, and uh, it keeps the probe keeps moving around because I'm trying to freehand it here. So this is actually a pretty decent result. So uh, the 1.5 gig passive probe is probably fine for this. I would not want to use the uh, passive divider probes for something like MIPI. And if we look closer at um, set our trigger level a little bit higher there. We can see there is a little bit of overshoot it looks on the high speed signal. And you can see it's packed in a couple of different lengths here and so on. Uh, so what I'm actually thinking is probably going to be most effective for this type of application, though, again, because we are, we, as a minimum, we need to get clock and data off of here, and ideally we'd want to get positive and negative data, but as a minimum clock and data, um, and this is a um, fairly high-speed signal, and we obviously don't want to be trying to freehand stuff on here. Um, the probe positioners that I showed earlier are likely not going to work well in these confined spaces just because, again, it's awkward angles. So this is where soldering probes come in handy. And so we're going to look at a couple of different soldering probes here. Uh, I think I'm actually going to go and use, I might actually demonstrate both just for comparison's sake, but we'll start with one of the, uh, let's see, actually, yeah, I, one of the AKLPT2s would probably be good for this, so I'll grab one of my probes and we'll see how those work.
All right, so this is one of my AKL PT2 probes. This is the same schematically, the same as that Pico handheld probe we were just talking about. So it's a piece of coax with a resistor at one end and uh, I connect throughout the other end. And if we go back under the scope, we can see at the tip we've got a string of 0402 resistors. In this case, we got three of them. Then we got a solder contact for signal and a solder contact for ground at one millimeter spacing. And so these are open hardware probes. They are available for sale as well if anybody's interested in an assembled unit. Uh, these actually, the ones that I'm demonstrating here, are actually um, production failures. So these went through my VNA testing and everything else, and they all ended up being just a little bit shy of where they should be. These were like five and a half gigahertz probes instead of six gig probes. Since I'm using the four gigahertz scope right now for this part of the demo, it doesn't matter, and you know, it means I'm not putting extra wear and tear on the nicer probes. So that'll work fine. Um, okay, so we wanted to look at, we'll say, probably, so that was the, I think that's the negative, um, Nippy one actually, but if we flip it, we should be able to look at the positive half. And it is actually just dumb luck, I didn't design it this way, that the pin pitch of this connector on the Pi and the pitch of um, the AKLPT2 tip are exactly the same. And so I can just go and stick this tip on here and it'll just fit perfectly. So. Yeah, I think I'm actually, I want to look at the positive half, which again, I'm pretty sure is the left side here. So I'm going to see how that'll work. So what I think I might do is use this for this half, and then I'll have to figure out what I'm going to do to probe the other side. Um, I will also have to work out the logistics of how to hold things. All right, so that is the negative lead. That's the positive side. So yeah, I guess I guess I'm gonna have to invert the probe and do it like this. Um, so let me grab some double stick tape to hold everything in place. I'm just putting some double-sided tape on top of a few different spots in the board to hold the probes in place. With any time you're using a soldering probe, it's very important to make sure that it stays put and doesn't get any kind of force applied to it. Because if you put force on it, you're going to at best rip it off the board and at worst maybe destroy it completely. I shouldn't have to add any solder because there's already solder on the pins and we should be able to just use that. to warm up. OK, 
I may actually have to add just this tiny bit of solder here. One side stuck on nicely, and the other side is going to be just a little bit more solder. I'll add a little more belt just to make sure. That should be our first probe held in place. Get a little bit of alcohol and clean it off. And then for the other side, what I'm actually going to do just not that it's strictly necessary because the clock on this is not super fast, but I was gonna I was gonna use another of my probes, but just for comparison's sake, I think what I'm gonna do is use one of the uh, Lacroix solder and differential probes just to show off the differences between them. I've got the platform module and the amplifier. I'm going to go get out and connect here. Fire module here. And I'll worry about the rest in a little bit. Um, LaCroix has this handy positioner, which you saw I used before on the handheld probe. It can also be used to hold the amplifier for the differential probe. Kind of like this, you'll see that a little bit once I get fully set up and still prepping things. Okay, so. This over here is the soldering tip for the differential probes. This one that we're using right now is the LaCroix D420, and this is the soldering tip for it. So to hold the tip in place, they have... So to hold the tip in place, they have this little gooseneck thing that you can bend to position as you see fit. And then this is the actual tip that slides into it. And to hold it to the board, they actually have, these are just the, like the 3M command strips that you hang stuff from the wall. You can actually even see the 3M logo on it if you, I don't know if you can see the light. But yeah, they appear to be custom cut. Um, I don't think this is a size that 3M sells off the shelf to consumers. So LaCroix probably either got them custom made or just made some kind of a jig to cut them out of the bigger strips. I've actually been thinking of doing something like that just because you can buy more of these from LaCroix, but it's stupidly expensive. It's like 40 bucks something for a 10-pack of these and a 10-pack of slightly different stickier ones. So, yeah, I'll probably end up making my own at some point. Anyway, so I'm going to go stick this tape onto there. 
and I gotta find a good position to attach the probe to the board. So I'm gonna attach the probe to the holder first and kind of figure out where I'm gonna put it. So you can see it slides in like that. That little plastic peg at the center goes through the hole in the tip and holds it in place. So we're going to be looking at the clock pair on here. So i got to figure out the best spot to position it. I'm thinking... Okay, yeah, I guess the top of the HDMI connector is probably going to be a good spot to attach the probe from. Yeah, that'll work. And again, if you'll note, I'm doing the same thing that I did on my probe, which is I come up with the position and I attach the probe to the board mechanically before I solder it. You don't ever want to be putting force on the solder joints, again, to avoid damage to either the board or the probe. Um, this tip, not the amplifier, the tip alone, LaCroix sells for like 800 bucks. So anytime you're working with a differential probe, be very cognizant of what you're doing and think carefully, plan several steps ahead as far as how you're actually going to position stuff. So like actually one of the things that is a little bit annoying now is now I've got the other probe on there and it's kind of blocking my easy access to the connector, so i got to figure out where I'm going to put the soldering iron to actually solder this. So that might be a little bit of a challenge. So i got to bend this a little bit differently. Right, so I can get that left one in there for sure if I hold the... I think I want to get the right one actually connected first, because that's going to be the more tricky angle there. Let's get some flux on it here. I'm gonna have to, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a tricky angle here. I think I might actually want to do a 180 on this and have the iron come in from the left. Maybe. There's not a good angle to do this. I may actually want to reposition the probe. That looks like it'll work. I would like that. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to move the probe and come in at a shallower angle. Think about where else I could attach this probe if I can't do it from there. If I come in, like, okay, so the Ethernet connector is too far back. Um, maybe the audio connector could work. 
Okay, yeah, that looks like a much better angle as far as being able to actually solder it. I'm a little concerned about how well it'll stick because the audio connector is not a lot of surface area to attach to, but we'll, we'll see how that works. Let's add just a little more solder and we should be good to go. Again, the, the Pi is a little bit of a challenging spot just because you've got the big CPU heatsink coming in from exactly the wrong position. Fingers crossed, have good contact at that point. All right, that looks good. So let's just go clean some of that uh, debris off of there. Get all the flux out of the way, and we can try and actually get some um, signals off. So now we've got to work out the actual positioning of all of the amplifier modules and cables to do this. So we've got the amplifier module, which is going to have to come in from like here. And then that's got to connect. Actually, you know, we don't need the uh, ground clip because we'll be grounding the uh, differential probe through the coax from the solder in the AKLPD2. Okay, so now we just need coax from here, 50 ohm SMA cable from here to the scope.
Okay, I'm off done setting up. So now we've got the Okay, so now we've got the differential probe tip soldered in place. We've got the open hardware passive probe soldered in place. We've got everything connected to the scope. Now we just got to go connect this. So anytime you're working with, pass with soldering probes again, it is important to make sure everything's secured. You don't want to be putting force on any of the cables or anything that affects the scope. So what I'm actually doing in this case uh, is... Uh, I'm going to use some Kapton tape, just because it's convenient and handy, to uh, attach the cable to the bench. And uh, I'm using actually a hand-formable uh, semi-rigid cable here. Uh, there's a flexible cable from so there's a flexible cable from here to the scope, and then this last bit is the stiff semi-rigid cable. And so that means that once I bend it in place, it's going to stay put. It's not going to put any force on my probe. So now I just jiggle that a little bit and get that in place. Um, if we were doing higher speed measurements, you'd definitely want to actually torque all these connectors. And I'll probably be doing that when we're doing higher speed measurements. But right now for MIPI, it's, it's not fast enough for a slightly loose connector to make a big difference in performance. So I'll just finger tighten everything. And then we just stick the tip onto the amplifier module here. Play with the angle a little bit so that looks good. Okay. So now we've got our differential probe on the clock. We've got our single-ended probe on the MIPI data. And we should be good to go and turn power on and see what we see on the scope. So, let's see, first things first, we've got here, we want to adjust our offset, so we're pretty much centered, so we want to see the differential clock, and that looks good, we've got our differential clock. Now on channel 3, that is our 50 ohm input, so we're going to want to do, that's a 10 to 1 probe, and it's a 50 ohm input. trigger on channel 3. And set our trigger level somewhere pretty high up so we can see the start of the packet. Okay, that looks reasonable. Let's just bump it up to catch a little bit more data. Alright, so now what we've got is we've got our MIPI data here, our clock here. Um, the scope that we're using does not have any kind of MIPI protocol decoding. I think LaCroix will sell it to you if you're interested. Um, I don't have that option. So let's actually shift gears here and jump to Geoscope Client and see what we can see with that. using. There's our SP clock. And there's our data. Okay, that's looking plausible. And now we can do the DeFi data. So channel 2 is our clock, channel 3 is the data. Just stop this for a second. We should be able to zoom in and see we've got valid looking data. And we can even actually do a, we know this is maybe DSI, so we can do DSI decoding on there. Although I 
it doesn't seem to be happy with us for some reason, so let's see if we can figure out why. Alright, why is it not liking this? Let's jump to 40 gigs, see if maybe the sound rate's too low. I don't think that's a good problem. and it's not liking this waveform. Um, let's see if we can figure out why. Oh, I, I bet our clock is inverted, maybe. That's probably what it is. Okay, no. is looking fine here. So we've got, let's say, so we've got a high speed one on that edge, we've got track on that edge. Oh, okay. Um, I see what's going on. So it looks like what's happening is we've got some skew between the, I'm actually going to close Jill's go for a minute and go back to the press up so we can see this just a bit more easily. So what we've got is there is clock skew here between the data and the DR clock. I think that's what's going on. see that um, we want to have the clock edges be when the data is stable and it looks like they're not quite there. So if, there's a couple different ways that we can correct for this. Um, let me think for a minute, it'll probably make the most sense. Um, in retrospect, this, this is something that we should have corrected for uh, before soldering the pros to the board. So, Fundamentally, what's going on here is the LaCroix probe and the uh, uh, XLPD2 have different propagation delays because the cables are different lengths, and so we just have to compensate for that. And so that is our let's get a cursor on there. Okay. So let's see if we can find a single bit. Oh, okay, yeah. All right, there we go. So we can see our we can see our problem right here. So this is the middle of a zero bit. We want the zero crossing of the clock to be here, and it's here. So there is a skew capability that we can do. Let's figure out first how much the delta is. So let's say like five hundred picoseconds. Okay, that looks, I think, a little bit better. So now we've got the middle of the data changing. Okay, that looks a little more like it. So let's see if we can decode this. Now. isn't happy with me for some reason. Let's see if we can figure out what's going on next. Maybe our skew is still not So, um... Okay, so 
first of all, that, that wasn't right there. It picked up the start of transaction too late, I think. Okay, so we got our high speed one. So I think now we need to invert the clock, maybe. Anyway, something is uh, probably off with the decode somewhere. I don't like not knowing what's going on here. <laughs> um, so the, everything seems to be lined up correctly. Or sampling, on rising, and the phone edge. That's smack in the middle where it should be. The start of transaction. So what, what, what's definitely up is the protocol here. It's seeing... I, I bet I know what this is. Hold on a minute. Um, I bet this is a bug that I had a while ago. Um, so this is DeFi data. There's, there's some debouncing logic in here to catch glitches, and I'm suspecting that's probably what's going on right here. I thought. Okay, so the start of transaction. Start of a transaction is LP00. Okay, one, so we got LP11. LPLL. Okay, so we think it's an LPLL. I right, think we glitch a little bit here. And we want to see an HS0. So what, what's happening for sure is that um, the protocol decode is seeing uh, the way that uh, DeFi is supposed to work is you've got the uh, low power zero state here. Uh, then uh, so it's going to drop to the LP zero one state, which we can't see because we're doing a differential measurement. Um, so it, it sees it as low power zero zero. Then the start of transition sequence. So we've got HS request. We want to see a high speed zero. Okay, so that puts us into sync zero. Then we got a high speed one. There's a bit of a glitch here as it tri-states the line. I think that's probably what's happening here. Probably the glitch filter in here. So I wonder if it's the DeFi symbol because it's actually screwing up. Uh, yeah, 
yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just looking at the glitch filtering here. I, okay, I bet, I bet that's what's going on. So 30 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds. Okay, no, that all looks fine. Anyway, um, so yeah, there, there, are, there looks to be some kind of gelscope client bug in the parsing of this waveform that I'm going to have to investigate. But more importantly, though, is we've got the signal. The signal looks clean, and everything that we want is there. So it's just it's just misinterpreting a correct signal. So uh, everything's looking good on the actual analog waveform. And again, that's really going to the focus of what I was trying to work on today. Um, so, does anybody want to see anything else on the MIPI side of things before I switch on to a different protocol or something else? Uh, we can do Ethernet, we can do USB, there's a bunch of other stuff we can look at. I think we're probably done with this, though. So let me disconnect our cables. Fixturing and uh, uh, securing probes for lower speed stuff. So, we'll definitely talk about some fixturing things. Get this probe out of the way first. And no, that solder. This should just look right off. Perfect. So now I can get this probe off the board. And then I gotta do the other one. difficult looking at these awkward angles and it's hard to see. Big ground plane here. It's getting all on I'm just gonna 
get just a little bit of preheat on there and it should come right off. Oh, I got the desoldering right off. All right, and the rubs off. Yep, just too much heat sinking from the ground plane. Now this probe can come off the board and I'm just gonna, oh, I still have some uh, desoldering right in there. Let's go clean that off. Anytime a soldering probe comes off, there's usually a bit of cleanup involved to uh, get everything back the way it should. So it looks like we took a little too much solder off that connector, so I'm going to just drop a little bit more on there. Right, and that looks good. So I'm just going to go get some of the excess flux off of here, and I think we're good to go on that. So one thing that we didn't do any of yet was using any kind of custom test fixturing for um, interfacing with various protocols. So I think it might be good to go talk about that because a lot of times the easiest way to observe a signal that's on any kind of a connectorized interface is just to design a test fixture that meets that connector. And then you don't have to worry about trying to solder anything to the board or anything like that. So having the fixture, again, especially if it is something esoteric, um, can save you a ton of time. So let me just finish putting away probe stuff and we'll get to see that shortly.
Alright, so what we're going to look at in the next is just default settings and stuff again. Alright, so what we're going to look at now is some Ethernet, I think. And we're going to be using this test fixture here. Which has uh, two multimode fibers on SFP plus optics coming in. And then at the other side is SMA connectors. So this is um, so a question about uh, type C PD. Um, so um, I don't know if the scope vendors have PDD codes handy. I, I know LaCroix has some USB decoding. I haven't looked at PD. As far as just scope client goes, um, no, there is not PD support at the moment. Uh, there is an open ticket for it. I actually have some PD hardware that I've been meaning to sniff, and so that probably will be added at some point. Uh, right now, there is support for USB 1 and 2. We have some of the groundwork for USB Gen 3, but it's not fully implemented. Uh, so yeah, that, that definitely is on the menu, but uh, not implemented right now. Anyway, so uh, this fixture is, uh, it takes 3.3 volts power in, it's got two SFP plus optics on it, uh, multi-mode fibers in, and then coax coming out. And so the way that this works is uh, coming off of the optics on the receive side, we've got next to the side of the microscope, so you can see a bit more clearly. Slack here. So what happens is we've got the receive differential pair coming off each of the optics, and we separate them, and they go into 50 ohm, 1 to 2, uh, 60 dB resistive splitters. So we've got our receive positive and negative coming off. They transition to coplanar waveguide on the other side of the splitter. And then that feeds into uh, two SMA connectors. And the same thing happens on the other side. And you'll notice the other output of each splitter disappears on the bottom of the board. And so what happens there is those pairs then loop around and go back into the transmit output of the other optic. And so what this gives us is the ability to sit in the middle of a fiber and obviously terminating the two ends of the fiber and um, be able to uh, observe the signals on the fiber through the optics, tap that off the scope in a non-intrusive fashion so communication via the fiber can still work. So I'm just going to go and pull some additional line off of it. Also another super handy little gizmo that uh, if anybody wants the design files for, uh, it's on my GitHub somewhere, I'll have to find it, but message me somewhere if anybody wants uh, the design for one of these. You guys press probably on Oshpark, I can make it a shared project or something. Uh, so it's just a red and a green LED in reverse parallel with some resistors that hooks up to a barrel jack so you can make sure that your pins are in the correct order to give center high or center note low, depending on what you're doing. Anyway, so what I'm going to do now is I've got a couple of adapters here that I'm going to rig up. So a pair of SMA to BNC adapters, and again, I'm still using the 4 gigahertz scope on purpose, and the reason for this will become apparent shortly.
and we should then be able to turn off our power and have a backup. So now, if we go to the scope view, we should be able to see. Well, that's interesting. So, I'm going to set both of these to 50 ohm. And everything else is good, and we're going to leave to what are sample. So right now, we've just got uh, idle traffic on the link. There's not too much to see if we zoom. You can see it's the same repeating pattern over and over again, and it looks pretty square. So this is uh, running in one gigabit mode, so it's 1.25 gigabit per second. And I'm just going to uh, take a quick look at, uh, I'm gonna grab a cable and plug in my laptop or something to one of the wall ports of this VLAN so we can go get some traffic to sniff. Alright, so I just set up a ping on my laptop that uh, I believe should be going over the correct VLAN to go have some traffic for us to see. So let's fire up Jailscope Point and do some decodes and see if there's actually going to be anything for us to look at. Okay, so there's not a ton of activity here. Let's so I'm still not seeing any traffic. Let's play with the number of points, see if maybe we can get some more points. And again, there there is a reason that I'm using this scope, and you'll see that in a bit. I'm actually just going to uh, go for a second and double check that my laptop is in the right VLAN to actually generate traffic for us.
And again, uh, what you're seeing now is one of the limiting factors of using a scope that does not have a hardware protocol trigger is it is difficult to actually be able to see a lot of this stuff. Uh, let me also... Um, yeah, all right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to some of the additional traffic stores and stuff in a little bit. But um, at this point, again, you can see if we look closer at the waveforms, uh, they look pretty decent. We can also do an eye pattern. And so this is where you'll kind of get a better view of, uh, let's say, 400 millivolts fixed scale. So you can definitely see there is, there is a, what are we looking at about? Um, yeah, it's like a 250-ish peak of second or so rise time. And so the edges are not super clean looking, but I mean, it, it's a nice open eye. It's just not vertical. And so this is well within the bandwidth capabilities of this scope. But if we try to go to something faster, you'll see that that's not the case. And so, just for comparison's sake, I'm gonna go move the fibers to another port and we're gonna see a 10 gigabit signal and note the difference. So let's delete that. So again, if we zoom in more on the individual uh, bits, what we'll notice is that if we have a run of a few ones or zeros in a row, like this, or separate ones and zeros, they're all the same height. And so that tells us that we have enough bandwidth to properly reproduce the signal, and again, higher bandwidth on the scope may give us better rise time and so on, but you're at least, you're not at the point that the signal is being severely degraded by either instrument or probe or fixture bandwidth. And so I'm just gonna go and like I said, move the fibers to another port and note the difference. Okay, so I've moved the fibers. I am going to resume capturing. And we do have to change our clock recovery, obviously, because now we're running at 10 gig. And clear our sweeps. And so now the eye looks a lot less pretty. And more importantly, though, is that if you take a look at the signals where you've got a period of a bunch of change and a period of a So we've got a period of a few uh, fast 0, 1, 0 transitions and then a run of several bits in a row. You'll notice that these bits reach the full amplitude and these do not. And so what's happening is that the scope does not have the bandwidth to adequately reproduce these fast transitions. And so although some of them do get through, they're severely attenuated. You're at looks like what, about a third or a quarter or so of the amplitude of the full signal. And so this leads to eye closure. And again, another sign that you are at the point of not having nearly enough bandwidth for a signal is when you see in the eye um, that your uh, signal is reaching a maximum below the top rails. That's a pretty good indication that you're getting bandwidth on it. And uh, I, I was a little bit surprised that this scope does actually have the sample rate, since it is 40 gigasounds per second, you can still resolve the bits. And so, if you're so inclined, um, okay, and it's exalted. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're so inclined, you can actually get um, a protocol decode of 10 gig Ethernet with this uh, scope. 
Now, I don't recommend it, but it can be done. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the exact same fixture using the exact same config. We'll jump back to the 1 gig and then we'll do 10 gig and uh, do it on a 16 gigahertz scope instead of a 4 gigahertz scope. And then, um, actually, while I still have the scope in this bench, I'm going to go back. Uh, I'm going to switch to the Pico scope so you can see what the 1 gig looks like on a 500 megahertz bandwidth scope. So let's give this one. Alright, so we've got our pick a scope bridge going and Of course, there's no music. So we've got uh, D and E is our inputs. It's not too happy with me. Um, as you can see, the PicoScope driver is still a little bit in the uh, alpha stage, so. Okay, I didn't like finding that either. I'll spend a few seconds trying to debug this to see if we can get somewhere. Um, but again, the PicoScope driver is still a work in progress, and uh, there are problems with it. <laughs> still complaining that it's the old Saga's news. All right, uh, we can get back to that in a bit. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to turn that off and shift to other stuff. Let's go grab some things up here. And so I'm going to switch to the scope over here. This is the 60 gigahertz scope. Okay, so now we've got our view on the other scope pulled up. Um, let me just go get uh, power to our fixture. And oh, I'm going to need um, one more adapter.
So since we are doing some higher performance measurements here, I am going to actually make sure I tighten off the connectors so we get maximum accuracy on our results. If I can just get this. So we're seeing nothing because we don't have these inputs selected. We should start seeing stuff in a second. Okay, so now we've got some traffic. Uh, and uh, what we are going to see is at this point, um, we're just looking at random idols and the like. So let's jump to channel two. So one of the things that we actually can do, actually I'm going to move one of these to channel 4 once I do the decode and uh, figure out which is which. Uh, the first thing we can do is this scope does actually have the uh, vendor's ap 10 b decode option on it. So we can do that and we're going to do on uh, the channel 3. Actually, try to see if we can catch any frames. We can set up the trigger. I do have to actually move to channel four on that. Uh, so, please. So now we can actually uh, zoom out for that. This, this scope has a protocol trigger for uh, AP10 decoding, so we can jump to the serial trigger here. It'll take a second. So we can say AP10B and set up. Just 
search for K2707. Okay, so we look like we're good. Um, so let's... Okay, yeah, so we're actually, we're actually seeing traffic now. Uh, the way we can tell that is uh, if we hit zoom on here, we get a dual grid. Now we should be able to actually see traffic. And again, I'm not sure if we have the polarity swap or not, so we'll have to go see. as far as the start of the... Okay, so it does look like we're swapped. So we can swap it in back. Okay, so that's looking like valid looking traffic. Um, you can see we've got 555, so that's the beginning of the infinite frame. So now let's, let's actually uh, turn off the... Now we can see the start of the frame here. And so now we got a bunch of arc traffic showing up. And so note how much easier this is uh, if you've got a hardware serial trigger rather than with the other scope, we were trying for quite a while to try and find a single packet and they were rare enough that there wasn't really anything to see unless you got really lucky. And so that's no longer a problem if you've got a harder protocol trigger. Um, the other thing, though, that is interesting is... One second. Um, so the other thing that is uh, uh, interesting to note about this scope is that since it has higher bandwidth, we're going to be able to see um, more traffic, or more uh, details. So if we turn some of that off, actually turn off the... Okay, now we're still seeing that. Okay. Um, so now we can turn on an eye pattern of that using the recovery clock. Looks like we've actually got a little bit of dewy cycle distortion here, but more importantly is um, we can see the rise times here are a lot faster than they were on the other scope. So we can see that's like 150 picoseconds from bottom to top, and that doesn't even count any of the uh, you know, usual measurements, so like 20 to 80 or 10 to 90 percent. 
It does look like we have a little bit of duty cycle distortion here, which is interesting. I wonder if one of these uh, cables is a little bit loose or something. Um, so, more interestingly though, we can go to 10 gig and see some more there. So, if we just go back to that and set our trigger to just a normal edge. Now I'm going to go swap the fibers and we'll see what it looks like at hang it. Okay, so now we're running at 10 gig, and let's set up a trigger for that. Uh, the reason that I'm, by the way, the reason that I'm using the uh, LaCroix software rather than um, Geoscope Client for the trigger setup is I just got the scope two days ago and I haven't implemented support for the serial triggers in Geoscope Client yet, so I have to use the vendor software for that. Um, okay, so. We're going to do serial trigger, and it's going to be 6466. This is 10 gig. Interesting that I'm not seeing a lock on it. Uh, what's going on here? Should be seeing some drag there. Uh, okay, so let's say one second. Interesting, we're not seeing any traffic. I wonder if we're looking at the wrong lane of the. Um, I'm looking at the wrong lane of the. Um, I can see if we can get a PLR lock. Alright, and so we're still not seeing anything on the sink. So yeah, let me see if I can't get something on the other pair as possible. I just have transmit and receive swap. Still not seeing any traffic, which is interesting. Uh, there's definitely data on the link. Obviously, we're getting a PLL lock and everything. Oh no, I think it's I think it's starting actually. To work. All right, now I think we're actually getting a trigger. Forget 
So yeah, it looks like it's working. So now we can turn the decode off. And now we should be able to pop up in just go find and see how it looks. like some valid ping packets, so that's good. Yep. Yeah, so that's the traffic we expect to see. And then again, uh, we can also do uh, upper decoding on the single out of state converting decode the differential. Um, And so note how much different it looks when you're using, let's, let's actually fix the height uh, of the So note how much different things look when you've got enough bandwidth for the signal versus when you don't. So if you have sufficient bandwidth, um, what you see is that um, the ones and the zeros of short bursts versus long runs are all the same height. And you will also see that um, the eye is going to be nice and open and uh, reaches full height and levels off rather than dipping. Um, so that's another good indication that you do have sufficient bandwidth. Um, let's see, uh, we can also talk about some other kinds of fixtures or probe securing or things like that, although uh, it seems like people are starting to either lose interest or get tired. Uh, it is starting to get a little bit late, so uh, does anybody want to see anything else or should we wrap up now? from anybody else, um, I guess we'll wrap up for now. Uh, there's definitely going to be opportunities to do some additional stuff. I have a whole PC with a bunch of instrumentation I've thrown on there and so on, but there's only so many different probing techniques I can do in one night before I start to decide it's time for dinner. So, uh, yeah, uh, thanks for watching, and uh, I will be back at some point.